Hi everybody, so there is a large current account deficit, let's say, that is a big issue in an economy. We know that governments have objectives to keep balanced trade, that is not to have large current account deficits. What are the policies available to governments to close that current account deficit? We are going to look at expenditure reducing and expenditure switching policies in this video to rectify a current account deficit. Let's start by looking at expenditure reducing policies. These are policies to reduce the amount of spending on imports in the economy. And the way in which these policies work is to reduce aggregate demand, reduce incomes in the economy, and therefore reduce the marginal propensity to import. Remembering that when consumers are richer in an economy, they tend to spend a lot of money on imports. So what policies can help do that? Well, contractionary monetary and fiscal policies, because these policies will shift aggregate demand to the left make incomes lower in the economy and thus reduce the marginal propensity to import and with that the expenditure on imports helping to close the trade deficit and then the current account deficit in the economy. So examples of contractionary monetary policy, raise interest rates, reduce the money supply for example, contractionary fiscal policy, reduce government spending in the economy, increase taxation levels in the economy. All well and good for the intentions that we've said, but on the other hand, you've got to consider that there is a big conflict of objectives here. By reducing aggregate demand, okay, you might close your current account deficit and improve your trade performance, fine. But there are other, more important, you might say, macroeconomic objectives for the government to hit. By reducing aggregate demand, growth is going to reduce, unemployment is going to increase, you might well cause a recession in the economy. Is that really worth closing your current account deficit. At the same time, with lower demand pull inflation in the economy, inflation might well go below the target rate, which is not ideal either. Could consumer and business confidence be so high that actually AD does not fall if interest rates rise, for example, or if taxation levels increase, for example? That's a nice evaluative point there. The level of the output gap, if the economy is already at full employment and AD reduces shift to the left, there is no guarantee that incomes are going to decrease in the economy at all. We might still be at the full employment level um, of output. And also you've got to question the marginal propensity to import. This whole idea, uh, expenditure reducing policies and contractionary monetary and fiscal policies are based on the idea that when incomes are lower in the economy there'll be a huge hit to import expenditure because the marginal propensity to import will be high. Well what if it's not very high in the economy? then these policies are not necessarily going to reduce import expenditure enough to make an impact on closing the current account deficit. We can look now at expenditure switching policy. One type of expenditure switching policy is to use protectionism, protectionist policies such as tariffs, quotas, embargoes, domestic subsidies, maybe non-tariff barriers. So a government can target um, certain imports of goods and services and use protectionism to again reduce import expenditure on those items or if it's domestic subsidies right to switch the spending um, on imports towards domestic goods instead hence the title expenditure switching policies by using protectionism the idea is okay money that was being used to spend on imports can now be used to spend on domestic goods instead so we switch expenditure away from imports towards domestic products domestic services instead all well and good in theory but the problem is retaliation, and retaliation is a big issue. If these policies are supposed to rectify a current account deficit, retaliation can actually make the current account deficit worse. By imposing tariffs, let's say, on the imports of goods coming from abroad, right? Uh, your trading partners overseas might see that as, as not a good thing at all, you know, hurting their export performance. So they will retaliate and put maybe uh, even worse tariffs on the imports of our own goods and services, on our exports. What does that mean? It means, okay, we've put protectionist measures on imports coming into our country, but there are worse tariffs on our exports, which means that, all right, we might save a bit of expenditure from imports because of the tariffs and protectionism that we've imposed, but if there, are, if there is worse protectionism now on our exports, maybe our export revenues will fall more than the import expenditure that we are saving. Hence, over the medium term, our current account deficit might actually worsen due to retaliation. We can't forget that being part of the World Trade Organization, imposing protectionism for these reasons may break their rules and there might be heavy fines imposed 
or there might be uh, laxer rules on foreign countries to impose protectionism on us. So there is a risk of going against World Trade Organization rules here. Protectionism can be inflationary, especially tariffs and quotas, which increase the price of imports. Um, higher prices for consumers and the loss of efficiency, all the arguments against protectionism that we've learned in other videos. So maybe another expenditure switching policy can be used instead. Um, remember expenditure switching to switch spending away from buying imports towards buying domestic goods in instead. Another expenditure switching policy could be to weaken the exchange rate. To weaken the exchange rate. And we know in theory that a weak exchange rate means imports become more expensive and exports become cheaper. WIDEC, remember. With more expensive imports, in theory, <clears throat> the demand for imports will decrease and the expenditure on imports will decrease. If exports are cheaper, in theory, the demand for exports will increase and therefore the revenues generated from exports will increase, helping to um, improve the trade position in the current account and therefore improve the current account position, given that the trade balance in the current account is the biggest part of the current account. So the theory is fine. How can that actually happen? What policies can a government use to weaken the exchange rate? Well, it wouldn't be the government in this case, but the central bank to reduce interest rates. By reducing interest rates, there is uh, a hot money outflow in the economy, more selling of the currency as uh, investors looking to chase the best interest rate for their savings, look at other countries where interest rates are higher. So lower interest rates incentivizes hot money to leave the country, hot money outflow, reducing the exchange rate. An increase in the money supply through a policy like quantitative easing, so pumping more money into the economy increases the supply of money and uh, actually reduces the value of the exchange rate. Or maybe uh, the central bank could sell domestic currency reserves. So all central banks have got reserves of their own currency and lots of reserves of foreign currency. So by selling their own currency and buying up foreign currency, they are creating extra supply of their own currency, which reduces the value of it. All of these three, in theory, will reduce the value of the exchange rate and, in theory, help to reduce the current account deficit. However, you've got to consider whether the Marshall Learner condition is being satisfied, i.e. questioning the elasticity of demand for exports and the elasticity of demand for imports. If the PD of X and the plus the PD of M does not sum to greater than 1, then a weaker exchange rate is not going to improve a current account deficit. It's actually going to make it worse. And remember, we've learned that in the short run, chances are that the Marshall Learner condition will not hold and we are going to see a Jacob effect where initially the current account deficit will worsen before it improves. So you need to consider the short run, long run ideas linked to the Marshall Lerner condition. Uh, watch my videos on the Marshall Lerner condition and the Jacob effect to make sure you're okay with this very key evaluative point. Uh, weak exchange rates can be inflationary from the demand pull side with AD shifting to the right, uh, but also from the cost push side with SRS shifting left with more imp uh, expensive imported raw materials and commodities now being imported into the country, increasing cost of production for businesses. And you also must remember that purposefully weakening your exchange rate is essentially a protectionist measure and there could be strong retaliation to that and big currency wars the end result. And if lots of other countries then react to you reducing the value of your exchange rate by reducing the value of their own exchange rate, then actually you yourself are not going to have the benefit of a lower exchange rate. Yeah. So uh, that's not a good thing. We've been seeing that over the last five or so years as one country has looked to reduce the value of their exchange rate and boost growth and reduce current account deficits that way. Lots of other countries have retaliated and followed and that reduces the gains. And lastly, you might want to consider this an expenditure switching policy. It's not wrong if you do. Or you might just want to learn them as a, as a general, a different type of policy, supply side policies. Supply-side policies have the intention to boost international competitiveness of a country's exports, either in terms of price competitiveness or in terms of quality competitiveness. Um, so all the supply-side policies that we've learned before, you could argue in terms of improving international competitiveness. Uh, policies like you know, government spending on education, government spending on, on infrastructure, government spending by providing subsidies to boost R&D expenditure in the economy, lower income tax, lower corporation tax, privatization, deregulation, labor market reforms, like reducing minimum wages, like reducing the, uh, uh, the power of trade unions, like taking away unemployment benefits. You can link all of these 
to improving the international competitiveness of a domestic exports, domestic goods and services. Uh, if you want to understand a bigger chain of how these policies improve international competitiveness, then watch my video on policies to improve international competitiveness. I go through some more detailed chains of analysis there. But the idea by improving international competitiveness is, okay, you can provide a boost to your export performance and a boost to export revenues, helping to close the current account deficit, but also by making domestic goods and services more competitive, uh, individuals in the economy can switch away from buying imports and purchase a domestic goods and services instead, reducing import expenditure. So you got it from both sides here. So it's not wrong to consider this as an expenditure switching policy as well. However, the problem with supply side policies to improve competitiveness, the classic issues we've talked about, they are very long run policies, they take a long time to work, they're extremely costly and carry a, a very large opportunity cost and there is no guarantee of success. There's no guarantee that they're going to work at all either. Another point to bring in here is for them to work they need to be heavily targeted. So for example if an economy's got large productivity issues which is increasing costs of production and making exports less competitive then supply side policies to improve productivity need to be used. If it's an investment issue in the economy which is why competitiveness is poor and exports are, are higher priced compared to uh, rivals in, in other countries then supply side policies to boost investment need to be used. So that's another thing uh, you can critique on the other hand. Are supply side policies targeted as to the real cause of why there is a current account deficit? Alright, so these are the expenditure reducing policies here. Policies designed to reduce spending on imports by reducing aggregate de demand in the economy. And looking at expenditure switching policies here. Policies designed um, to switch spending away from buying imports towards buying domestic goods and services and finally some supply side policies to boost competitiveness as well. So that really is the heart of your essay, the heart of a debate uh, on this topic. What about some evaluation points to consider throughout your essay, but then crucially in your judgment? Well, always look for conflict of objectives. We know what macroeconomics uh, is all about, and that is about achieving all of the objectives together, not achieving um, a satisfactory trade position, for example, but then losing growth, unemployment, and inflation. That's not what macro is about. So any time that these policies cause a conflict of objectives, that's very, very good evaluation. Always consider the cause of the current account deficit. You know, there are some causes which require very specific policies. There is no point, for example, um, uh, using, contract, using expenditure reducing policies, like contractionary monitoring and fiscal policy, if you have competitiveness issues at the root of the problem. So the cause of the deficit is important to know to then target the solution using the correct policy. Consider the time lags involved, so how long will these policies work? If we need short-term solutions, then expenditure reducing policies are better. If there are long-run issues, then we need policies that are going to overcome that. Um, however, if we need short-term quick solutions, then supply-side policies aren't necessarily going to give you uh, that short-term improvement. And also consider the cost. There are various policies here that are very expensive and carry large opportunity costs. Especially with supply side policies, you can weigh up that they're very costly and there is no guarantee they're going to work. So they're very risky and dangerous. The opportunity cost argument, you can argue, is greater here. And this point down below is a very strong point to make. Is the current account deficit actually a problem? You know? It's only really a problem if it's greater than a certain size. So for example, economists will say, if your current account deficit as a percent of GDP is greater than the rate of real GDP annually in the economy, then you have a real issue. Then there maybe is a notion to intervene. That is because think about how current account deficits are financed, often by borrowing money and by running a financial account surplus. So essentially, if your current account deficit, i.e. your borrowing, exceeds the amount of income that you're earning in a given year, i.e. your real GDP, then that is not sustainable over time. Then it is a concern. Then there is a rationale to intervene. But if your current account deficit as a percent of GDP is lower than the annual rate of GDP increases in your economy, then actually your borrowing is less than your annual income. So that can be sustained over time. Then maybe that current account deficit is not an issue. And needing to intervene is not necessary at all. So that's a nice way to argue it as well. Is the current account deficit really an issue? It's only an issue if financing it is very difficult and unsustainable. Bear that in mind as well when it comes to a judgment. 
So that covers everything that you need for a big essay on this. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I'll catch you all in the next video.